are looking at the seven churches. I'm hoping by the time we get to number seven, we'll find Starville somewhere. Uh, well, actually, in looking at all of them, we're found in all seven of them, aren't we? Because uh, really, all of them are for our day. Uh, you know, there's been historical significance placed on these, saying this church is for this age and this church is for this day age, but I think all of the churches are for our age. And there's certainly principles that apply uh, in all of them. Now we know this city, Pergamon, which is in current uh, language called Pergamos, the, the church there, was an influential city in the Roman Empire. It was on the western shore of Turkey, uh, near the sea. It was a city of martyrdom. We know one of the early church fathers was martyred there. And it was a difficult place. It is also said to be Satan's throne. And that's using Jesus' words in verses 12 and 13. And he encouraged the church to hold fast and that they not deny the faith. And he, he said that was happening. They were doing what they were supposed to and gave the example of Antipas who was in that city and had given his life. Uh, we also looked last week at the teaching of Balaam and eating food sacrificed to idols and uh, the practice of sexual immorality that he was warning that church about. And that's a similar warning that happens later in another church that we're going to look at in a future week. But let's just read those verses from 12 to 17 of Revelation chapter 2. It says, And to the angel of the church of Pergamum write, The words of him... Who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name. And you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness. And that's a powerful statement. He's saying you have held steady, even when your leader was murdered brutally. Even when those around you were suffering persecution, you held my name. I, I'd like that to be said of all of us, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. So he starts off with the good news and what they're doing right, but then he addresses issues that need dealt with. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. And that's going back to the first verse. He says he'll war against them with the sword of his mouth, but he said that he has the sharp two-edged sword. In other words, he's the one that ultimately brings judgment. And this is in Jesus' words. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some hidden manna. I will give him some of the hidden manna, I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. There's a tendency in all of us to be lazy. Isn't that true? Over time, we tend to be lazy. Uh, just think of New Year. At the beginning of the year, there's all these, this is going to happen this next year. I'm excited for the new year to start. In December, we're already talking about it. Once the new year starts, this is going to happen. And there's a strong determination early on to succeed, to get our grit together and just push through and see that things get done. But over time, I think we all have to admit, you can just get worn out. And you want to start to slide. My wife would experience this when she was teaching school. Come about May, kids just wanted to, well, they didn't even want to show up, quite frankly. There's this tendency 
to just let everything go, go to a lazier state. And we can expect everything to still happen quickly in our life, even when we slow down. We live in a culture that we want everything to happen quickly to us, don't we? We put instant coffee in the microwave and expect to go back in time. All right? We want things to happen quickly for us. But we tend towards ease and comfort. Now, Proverbs 6, 9 through 11 says, how long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. But then it goes on to say that poverty and destruction are right around the corner. Between that place and the beginning of the year place, there's this location in our life where we want to do just enough to get to get by if i can do just enough to get by i want it to be good enough not great but good enough the idea of completely conquering something seems difficult and at times impossible with the passage of time isn't that true we start out with many goals and we have good intentions early on and there's vim and vigor and excitement. It's good enough. What's done is done. Let it be. Now, God's grace and Dealing with our past is a huge issue, isn't it? Aren't you thankful that he has offered forgiveness to us? He has offered that to every one of us. Now, whether we have it or not, that's a different question, but he's offered it to us. If we repent, which means to turn around, it doesn't just mean to say, I'm sorry. But if we turn around, he says he will forgive us. Not only is it there, but he'll actually do it. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm so thankful for what he's done, aren't you? He has dealt with our past. He's still dealing with our past. Isn't that true? You ever wake up in the middle of the night and worry about something that happened 30 years ago? That happens to all of us, doesn't it? He's doing that. He allows that to happen to us so that we'll deal with the issue. And it all comes down to forgiveness. Either we got to give it or we got to get it. Sometimes we just have to give forgiveness away. Doesn't matter what happens, we have to forgive. Sometimes we have to be forgiven. We have to make something right. We have to deal with it. But those past issues are about forgiveness. All right? He is willing to forgive us, but we have to respond. So when you wake up in the middle of the night in that cold, sweaty situation, thinking about something that happened in the past, it's about forgiveness one way or the other. Either give it or get it, but deal with it. It's got to be dealt with. But I'm thankful his salvation is about our past, isn't it? But it's not only about our past. It's about our present. And it's about our future. Salvation, we like the concept that it's a one-time event. And, okay, I got that done. What's the next step? No. No. The whole thing in one sense is salvation. It's a process. Yes, he began a good work in us, but he'll complete that work in us. But in that journey of that completion process, we can get worn out just we do as we do with natural things. We can allow that to come in and affect our spiritual life and just say, I'm just tired of this process. I've gotten old along the way. I don't have the same fight that I once had. 
Have you felt like that? I felt like that this week. I felt like that yesterday. So far today I haven't felt like that, but I'll let you know if it happens in the middle of the sermon. If four of you fall asleep during this, I'll start to feel that way. But we weary in the journey, don't we? But he has given us forgiveness for the past, but as part of that salvation plan, he also gives us grace in the present. And he promises grace in the future. But what are we doing with that? Our, our salvation is a process that must continue on moving forward. We know in Matthew 24, 13 that we're called to endure to the end. Now, you can take that word endure two different ways. One way is, I will keep enduring this pain. Or you can say, no, I'll keep pressing, I'll get to the end. What is our attitude in it? Are we dragging a weight behind us? Or are we, are we seeing God's grace in the moment to carry something we can't? Where are we in all of this? So if salvation is for the now, and if it's for the future, what is it from? Is Jesus just trying to save us from hell? No. In fact, that's not a scripture verse, is it? Jesus saves us from our sins. He wants to save us from our sins. If there is sin, there's still saving that is needed, isn't there? And the fact is, all of us are in the middle of sin, aren't we? Now we've confessed and repented for things in the past that he's brought to our light, hopefully. But there's also grace right now to deal with where we're at in this journey. Now we can just become frustrated with that process because it's a process that's hard and we don't like the way we are or maybe we like the way we are and don't want to change any further, saying, I'm good enough. But he wants to deal with the whole thing. Not just the past, but the present and the future. God's work is not finished with any one of us. There's more for us to do. Now, a lot of times when we think there's more for us to do, we think of some work that we can do for him. What can I do for him to gain his approval? Because we've lived in a culture, this world's culture, that says if you do something, you get a reward for it. There is truth to that. But we put that same principle on his love for us. But he does love us. Does he love us right now? He does. And because he loves us, he sends his grace to us that he can deal with issues that we're facing right in front of us. Now we have these verses throughout these seven churches in every, the end of the writing of every one of the seven churches uses this phrase, to the one who conquers. To the one who conquers. It can also be in a, said in another way, actually in some older translations, it says to the one who overcomes. To the one who overcomes. The idea of being conquerors or overcomers is mentioned in all seven prophecies to the churches. And it's, it must be significant for some reason because not only is it mentioned, but it's kind of the conclusion of what happens at the, each of the, the end of each prophecy to the churches. Jesus seems very concerned that we conquer, that we are overcomers. Now I look at a lot of areas in my life 
And I, well, I can say I am saved by his grace right now, by his ability. But I look at a lot of areas in my life, and I am not a more than conqueror. I am a much less than conqueror at times. And it's at those times where I feel that I'm less of a conqueror, I feel like, what's the use? I'm good enough. But Jesus is encouraging us in the, this message to the seven churches that we're called to conquer, to be overcomers, to be overcomers. The, uh, this idea of being an overcomer or conqueror is mentioned in the New Testament quite often. However, it's really emphasized in the book of Revelation. Why is it in the book of Revelation? Because that's about the end. That's about our destiny of where we're headed. And it's very important for every one of us. Now, I was very thankful during our open praise and worship time that this verse was quoted this morning already. Because I was unsure of this message. And once I heard the verse, it was like, okay, we can go forward with that. I was, well, I was having one of those middle of the road journeys myself. But in Revelation 12, 10 and 11, it says this, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him, or overcome him, by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even to death. Now that's a very powerful verse. It's not in, mentioned in one of the seven churches, but it's in the book of Revelation where this idea of overcomer and conqueror is mentioned so often. He says they loved not their lives unto death. In other words, they wanted to be an overcomer so much that they would die for it. They would die for it. They would give all for it. And how, how, were, they, how are, were they, or we, more importantly, going to be conquerors? Well, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. By His covering blood over us, but then based on the words of our testimony. And the words of your testimony are what you speak out of what you believe. That's real life. That's real down-to-earth things. That's not just what you, how you talk in church. That's how you talk in everyday life. Eventually, we're called to overcome the accuser of our brothers. Now, there's a lot of names for the accuser of our brethren. We could say the evil one. We could say, we also say many times Satan. The, the powers of darkness that come against us. We're called to overcome even that. It's not a person, but that being called to overcome that being. The idea of conquering is used in the Greek language in the Bible to mean, or to have, it's given the concept of being able to prevail to get victory in all circumstances. To carry off victory or to be victorious. It's combined with other helper words in the Greek language. And we get the phrase that's mentioned in another place in Scripture in Romans to be more than overcomers, not just overcomers, but more than overcomers. Now, we're, we at Starville are, are used to that word a little bit because the word for overcomer is nikeo. And the word for more than overcomer with that little helper word on the beginning is Hooper Nikeo. Hooper Duper Nikeo, if you want to go beyond that. But it's more than overcomer. He's called us 
to be overcomers. In Romans 8, 37, it says, Nay, in all these things, we are more than overcomers through him that loved us. We've got to realize he loves us. He loves us, doesn't he? When that issue gets settled in our life, that he loves us, he loves us for how we were made. He loves us even the way we are. Now, he doesn't want us to stay the same. we got to understand that. But he loves us right now. But there's more he wants to do in us. So what does that mean for us? How do we respond to that? In 1 John chapter 5, I'm just going to read one verse, verse 4, it says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. We're going to read verse 5. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? He has called us to be overcomers of the world overcomers of the world now does that mean he wants us to be the president of the un no that's not what it's talking about that word world here overcoming the world it literally means the orderly arrangement around us around each of us even there's an orderly arrangement around you isn't there You've got yourself, you've got your family, you've got your work life, you've got your church, that's part of it. It's those things that are close to you. But it's also this thing. This thing. This thing is also the world. Right? He's called us to be overcomers. Now, the words used to overcome the world, the world has power on us, doesn't it? What does it have power over? It has power on our flesh, right? We were somewhere this week, and it was very hard for me to drive down the road and not stop at most Dairy Queens we drove by. <laughs> the heat index was above 90 degrees, and buster bars had special meaning. In all but one instance, I was able to overcome the world. <laughs> but in that one instance, I had just eaten a full meal. And I had dessert. And then I said, we're going to Dairy Queen. <laughs> the world has influence on us, doesn't it? Now that's a very natural way. Buster bars are extremely tempting. They can affect us, right? It affects our flesh. My flesh loves that idea. But it affects us in more subtle ways as well. And stronger ways that even affect our eternity. It includes demonic influence that comes against us. I think all of us have had experiences where we met the Lord in a special way on Sunday morning. Sunday morning here at church and we feel excited and encouraged and we feel that the Lord's meeting with us in a new way only by Tuesday morning to start believing what the world tells us that this is all ridiculous and we want out. We're so discouraged that thoughts that the demonic place in us that our life is valueless can come in and take over. And that's a lie. It's not true. Yet, that demonic influence does come and it hurts all of us because Jesus loves me, doesn't he? And because he loves me, he's calling me to be an overcomer. So when Tuesday morning comes, he wants me to arise above that. To overcome that. To go beyond that. What else does this affect? Well, 
it affects our sin too, doesn't it? What we imagine in our heart and then carry out, either in thought or in deed. Because both of those can certainly live in the land of sin very easily. But he's called us to be overcomers even in that area. To deal with those issues. Now, I have not met anyone that I'm aware of that has been an overcomer in this area. But that doesn't mean it's not what the Lord has for us. What his will is for us. He's called us to be overcomers. We are not just to be forgiven of our sins, but we're to have victory in obtaining his overcoming power over the sin that is in us. That means we've got to accept his grace here and now where we are in the middle of life so that our flesh doesn't give in to sin. So that the demonic powers don't have influence over us. So that the world does not influence us. We're over all of it. Now, in these seven churches, he pronounces huge blessing, huge blessings on each of the churches. And that blessing is all tied to being overcomers. I can say there are some areas of my life I've had a portion of victory. I'm a bit of an overcomer in a few areas. Now, if I talk about that long enough, it'll prove that pride is not one of those. <laughs> but the Lord has brought victories in our life, hasn't he? Has he brought victories in your life? He has. There are things that I struggled with 20 or 30 years ago that the struggle, it's not gone, but it's less now. Isn't that true? Why is that? It's by his blood and my confession that that's changing over time. But that change is only a picture of what he still wants to do in us. He wants us to overcome the world, the demonic influences, as well as the sin in our life, because they're all tied together. And they're only there to separate us from his love. But he doesn't want that to happen. So there are huge blessings that are pronounced upon these seven churches if they overcome. So let's look at those very quickly. Chapter 2, verse 7 in Ephesus. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now the tree of life was given in the garden for us to partake. However, we skipped it and we went to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And there's been a problem ever since then, hasn't there? But he says, I'll give them that opportunity once again. To eat of the tree of life. What happens when you eat of the tree of life? You live forever. Things stay the same. Last night, I was on the back porch. My wife was cutting my hair. And she was gleefully commenting how much gray was falling. I considered that rather wicked. She has some overcoming to do herself. <laughs> we're all going to get older and we're all going to die, right? But he's saying we can partake of the tree of life to those that overcome. No, I'm not there yet. I want to overcome. I'm going to die. If the Lord tarries long enough, I'm going to die. But I want to overcome to partake of that tree of life. Smyrna, Revelation 2.11. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. This is a progression. 
not only will we partake of the tree of life, but there is a death, but then there is a second death. Now, I'm not looking forward to the first death, but the second death we don't want to participate in. Revelation 21 at 8, it says, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. Well, we all qualify there, and all liars. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. There's a second death. I don't want to participate in that. That means we have to overcome some of these, no, all of these things. We have to overcome them. So we'll partake of the tree of life. We won't participate in the second death. In Pergamum, to the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. What is the hidden manna? Well, that's referring actually to the manna that was held in the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, the place where God dwells was on top of that. It was that, if we could say it's that nourishing food that comes just from him. I will give him a white stone. The white stone is a historical concept. It was used in courtrooms or it was used also by voters. If you were given a white stone, you were set free. It was a sign of acquittal in a judicial sense, and it was a sign of how you were going to place your vote in a political sense. It also says that with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. He'll give us a name. Wouldn't you like to have a new name at times? Thyatira, chapter 2, verse 26. It says, the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end. Now that's part of it, doing his will, keeping his works. To him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. As when earth pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. We're meant to have spiritual authority from him. I've prayed for spiritual authority before, haven't you? Lord, would you allow this to happen so I could carry this out? But if we're not overcomers, that's hard to get answered. According to this verse, we must be overcomers. Sardis, chapter 3 and verse 5. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. White speaks of purity. Will be pure and righteous before him. I will never blot his name out of the book of life. Wow. If we're overcomers... The concept of eternal security is there, is what that's saying. But are we overcomers? I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Having his name, I want to confess him, but imagine having him confess me. He will confess our name. The Church of Philadelphia, verse 12. Chapter 3, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall never go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own name. He inscribes his name on us. His name. Finally, Revelation 3.21 the one who conquers or overcomes, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. We'll sit with him on his throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Jesus was the first one to overcome, wasn't he? And because of it, he was given this throne next to the Father. And he's saying if we overcome, we can sit with him on the throne. Now, James and John 
their mom had a request to Jesus. What was their requ her request? Yep, that their son, her son sit on both sides. If you sit on the throne with Jesus, that request of sitting on both sides seems disappointing, doesn't it? Sitting on the throne with him, being in that place where he's at. We are called to be more than conquerors. And I want to encourage us all with this this morning because I believe it's possible for all of us. It's not probable, but it's possible. If we claim the full blood of Jesus and make him our whole confession, there's such reward. The rewards that are mentioned to the, the overcomers of these churches in some ways to me, are beyond belief. They're beyond anything we can imagine. We have this dreamy idea of heaven with chubby angels and golden streets, which I'm not sure what golden streets even mean. If the streets are gold, what happened to the blacktop? I have no idea. But we're promised things beyond anything that we can imagine. But we're promised those things even right now if we overcome and he's offering that to us there is that possibility he's called us to be overcomers I want to encourage us today we don't want to be those that just barely make it just slide in just enough if I can do just enough, Lord. What are the bare minimums? I think if we have that attitude, we're going to be disappointed in eternity. Because there's so much that he's promised in these. And the last one being, we'll sit on his throne with him. To be with him. Now I'd like to go back to a verse that we read at the very beginning. The one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God and he will be my son. He's called us to be close to him. We don't want to settle for less, do we? We don't want to settle for less. We want to push into all that he has. Not saying, Lord, I, if I could just do enough this week. But he's called us beyond that. He's called us to reach the very highest that he has for every one of us. Now the path there is not easy. He's promised us it won't be easy. He's even said we've got to live our life such that we don't love our life more than death. That we're willing to give up our life to die. We don't love our life to the point where we're not willing to die. But he's called us to overcome. Let's stand together this morning. I trust we can be encouraged this morning that he has ongoing purpose for us. That no matter where we are in the journey, no matter how frustrated we are, no matter how irritated we are, no matter how much it seems like when is this ever going to end? That we'll have that hope of overcoming. Of reaching his highness. Highest. Because he has so many promises for us. These promises are only offered to those who overcome. And it makes me say, Lord, I don't know how it's possible. But I want to conquer. I want to conquer. Lord Jesus, we come to you today. And Lord, the message of the seven churches is for us. <coughs> and Lord, we don't understand how you can do it. But you said by your blood, by our confession, that this is possible. So Lord, we want to reach. We want to reach for what you have for us. Lord, you have called us to be conquerors. Lord, that's conquerors over this world around us. 
That's conquerors, overcomers over demonic influence. That's conquerors or overcomers over sin. Lord, you've promised us so much and it seems impossible that any of us could, could see you meet in this way. But Lord, we invite you. We invite you. And Lord, we say we want to push by your grace. Lord, by your grace, realizing that you have loved us so that we might obtain what you even have for us, what you desire for us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.